All right, everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike, and today we're going to take a look at the Hanway Tinker Norman Sword. So why is it called the Tinker Norman Sword? Um, it's because that this sword was designed in conjunction with Michael Tinker Pierce, who happens to be a pretty well-renowned swordsmith um, who does very high-end work but he partnered up with Hanway to work on a number of pieces and of course um, this sword was designed uh, with him um, having a great import into its features and its specifications and then Hanway went ahead and carried out uh, the production and execution of his design. So, just to clear something up, you know, Han, uh, Michael Tinker Pierce did not actually make this sword. He helped design it with Hanway. Now, uh, you guys may be more familiar with the Michael Tinker Pierce uh, Hanway long swords and bastard swords. They're HEMA favorites because of their prices. And so, here is a different type of offering. This is a much earlier type of medieval sword. Uh, known as a Norman sword. So let's real quick take a look at the different features of this thing and then we'll get into the other parts of the review. So uh, let's get rid of the scabbard. We'll talk about the scabbard later. Um, so here we go. This is a very typical uh, Norman sword of about the 11th century. So take a look at we got a peen construction here. Um, which is interesting because a lot of the other um, Tinker Pierce swords from Hanway have a nut construction. This is actually peen. We got a leather wrapped grip here. I believe this is a wood core with leather wrap. We have a very simple time period appropriate uh, cross guard here, which is basically just a bar. And we have a 5160 high carbon steel uh, type 10A blade here. Um, and of course, I'm referring to the Ewart Oakshot typology. Uh, you do, like I said, you do get a scabbard. And this sword runs for about $289 on Cult of Athena's website right now. So I will put a link down in the description below uh, to Cult of Athena where this sword is. I believe it is out of stock. I did not get mine at Cult of Athena. I got mine at a different blade shop. Uh, and I think I paid less than $289. I think I paid around $220. It must have been on sale. But yeah, definitely within the budget range when it comes to swords. Let's talk a little bit about the type of sword that Hanway and Michael Tinker Pierce have uh, collaborated together to create here. So as the title of this sword indicates, or the name of it, I should say, is, it is a uh, Norman sword, which means that this sword dates from around the time period of the Norman conquests um, or the general era uh, in which the Normans were active uh, throughout Europe and of course in, uh, in, in modern day England. And uh, so this dates from around the 11th century. Now what it is classified as is a type 10A, and we're using the Ewart Oakshot typology system of course. It is a type 10A blade. Um, and so what that means is that this is a very broad, wide, uh, relatively Thin, although this example is not particularly that thin, but very broad, wide, flat blade with this very um, wide central fola that runs almost the whole length of the sword right up to this point here. So, so almost pretty much the whole length of the sword, and it's it's wide and it's quite deep. Um, Ten type tens are sort of differentiated from this one by having an even wider fuller. Um, although it's supposed to be not that shallow. Now, uh, some speculate that the Type 10A was more meant to be used on horseback as opposed to foot, although I'm not really sure how accurate that is. These particular swords were known to be used both on foot and horseback, but there is this idea uh, floating out there that the 10A as differentiated from the Type 10, uh, would have been more at home on horseback. Now, while the, I can't confirm that because I'm not a historian uh, in this sort of stuff here, what I can confirm is how this particular sword handles. And yes, I can see how this would be very advantageous to be used um, on horseback. It 
has a over 30 inch blade. It's just over 30 inches. It's very forward weighted. Uh, so obviously that this sword is optimized for cutting. You could thrust with it if you needed to, but it's definitely a cut centric sword. Uh, it has this very short grip here, very reminiscent of swords of the Viking era. And that's one of the coolest parts of uh, this particular sword. And it's one of the things that really drew me to it is that it's sort of a transitional sword between the Viking era and sort of early medieval, um, I'm sorry, the um, later medieval periods when they have a dedicated arming swords and one-handed swords. Uh, you can still see the influence of the Viking era here, especially with the uh, Brazil nut style pommel and the very short grip. And of course, this blade, the Type 10A and Type 10, were commonly used on Viking swords. Uh, where it differs, of course, is, you know, you have this um, really long cross guard although even in the Viking era um, there are have been some Viking swords known to have uh, long cross guards very similar to this and the cross guard speaking of which is just a simple bar it does have a little bit of uh, dimension to it um, it's rectangular but it is a very simple bar and this was very very common and typical of historical examples just a very simple bar really no adornment and uh, it's it's quite simple yet practical so yeah I think as far as nailing down this type um, I think Hanway did a fantastic job and it is not a very nimble sword when we talk about handling characteristics I can't see you doing um, quite intricate fencing techniques uh, with this sword simply because it's just so it's 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 weighted for very powerful cuts and it's very important to understand that this would have been used um, in conjunction with a shield it's extremely important to understand that because uh, if you're going to be doing these big powerful blows you want to be able to cover the rest of your body um, while striking uh, otherwise you'd just be exposed and uh, you'd get cut down pretty quickly so it's very important to understand that this sword was meant to be used with a shield um, it this particular example here weighs uh, two pounds, eight ounces, so exactly two and a half pounds, and that's what's advertised on Cult of Athena. So, of course, I put the link down in the description below uh, to Cult of Athena where you can see um, the different specs for this sword. But it does weigh in, and my example weighed in at exactly two pounds, eight ounces. And you know, it's not a heavy sword, it's just not a very nimble sword. And you can tell just by how wide this blade is that this is a very beastly cutter and uh, it does actually cut very well which uh, you'll see from the test cutting footage so yes I do think it's very um, a very nice representative example of the type 10a Norman era sword so yeah let's take a look at some of the test cutting and then I'll come back and I'll give you guys my final opinion of whether or not I think that this sword is worth your money Here is the edge after I've sharpened it. So, much better. 
All right, so you can get these blades both blunt or sharp, depending on uh, what you want to do with the sword, whether you're gonna do sparring, you want the blunt version. If you wanna do cutting like I do, you want the sharp version. So the sword did come uh, sharp. I ordered it as a sharp. However, the edge was not really that good. You could easily run your hands on and it didn't cut paper very well and uh, it just wasn't very sharp. So I went ahead and did my own um, edge on it actually the edge geometry is very very good on this sword so i didn't have to do too much i just uh honed it up with a thousand grit belt and uh that's what it is now so i'm gonna test the sharpness on a pool noodle and yes these are favorites of backyard cutters because one they're cheap uh and two uh, you get a lot of cuts out of them and three um although it's a very soft target people say hey mike why do you do pool noodles um, that seems like it's not a very tough target to cut. Actually, it is if your edge is not sharp and if you don't have good edge alignment, you will not cut this thing. I guarantee you it'll just bat around and uh, as Matthew Jensen says, it just sort of laughs at you. So uh, let's check my edge sharpness on uh, the uh, Hanway Tinker Norman sword. All right, I'm gonna start up here so I can get uh, a lot of cuts out of this thing. And yeah, that was just a very light swing. Um, and as you can see, the sword is sharp. Nice clean cut on the uh, pool noodle. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. And as you can see there, I didn't have good edge alignment. And as a result, uh, it didn't cut. So perfect example of what I'm talking about. You go pretty nice huh guys so the sword would have been meant to be used with a shield i don't have the correct time period appropriate shield so i'm using this large buckler but um it would have been meant to be used with a shield and it's very important um if you're trying to understand how these things move around and how they're supposed to be used to understand what kind of weapon systems they're supposed to be used with so All right, guys, so there's something I just wanted to point out real quick. Um, the tip of this sword, it, it, it has really good distal taper and it narrows out quite thin uh, at the point. Now, I was doing some test cutting and some, some general maneuvering with the sword and I happened to strike the ground uh, with one of my swings um, because it is actually quite a long blade and I am kind of short. So I struck the ground and I happened to strike a rock on the ground. So perfect storm there. And you can see that the tip has um, rolled a little bit here. Uh, you can see it right there. Yeah, so uh, just something to note about the tip of this sword um, is that it is quite thin. So you might wanna be careful um, with certain things if you're doing test cutting. Um, I'm a little surprised that it rolled so easily. Um, I don't notice really anything else wrong 
with the blade um, of the sword. This is 5160 high carbon steel and um, Hanway does heat treat their stuff quite well. So uh, I'm not sure if it's just a little bit softer here at the tip or if just overall the heat treatment on this sword is kind of soft. But anyway, if you were to take any sword and sort of hit it into a rock, um, you would end up with something like this. So it's not really a dock uh, or a knock on this particular sword's uh, quality. So just wanted to point that out though. Okay, we're gonna move on to a little bit of wood cutting. I got a piece of very dense uh, and thick uh, pear wood. Um, from a pear tree that I did some pruning on um, right before the winter and so this is actually still quite green so that's I guess pretty good for cutting and uh, I like to do these tests because it shows uh, a little bit of durability on the hilt and the blade and also shows um, what kind of cutting capacity it has on hard targets so let's just see uh, what it can do with this Okay, so it's actually quite a decent cut. You can see it right there. Uh, yeah, not bad. Let's try it again. Oh yeah. That was a good cut guys. Check that out. Very, very nice. Almost all the way through. Can see that. Very decent. All right, this is a much thicker piece. So, let's see what we can do here. Oh yes, check that out. Very, very nice cut. Uh, I'm actually quite, quite pleased with that one. Let's try it again. Try this side. All right, pretty good once again. This is very dense wood, guys, so I, I don't expect it to go all the way through, uh, especially how I'm hitting it here on the stump, but I am actually quite pleased. I think those are very decent cuts. Okay, so I'm looking at the blade, I'm looking at the edge after doing that wood chopping, and I really don't see um, anything out of sorts um, with the blade. It looks to me, actually, it looks like it has a very slight bend. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can just barely see it, but it is there. Uh, it looks like the sword has taken a slight set uh, up by the area where I have been striking the wood. It's very, very hard to see, but it is there, guys. So the sword has taken uh, a little bit of a set. I'll see if I can straighten it out. But in terms of the edge, there is no edge damage um, that I can see. I don't see any edge rolling or uh, chips or deformation of any kind. Just that the edge, uh, the, that the sword has taken a little bit of a set. And so that is kind of consistent with the uh, tip rolling there because uh, it looks like that this is actually kind of um, soft um, for this type of steel and this, this sword. It looks like that they might not have gotten the heat treatment uh, correctly on this. So I'll see if I can bend it back and get it a little bit straighter and then um, I will also try to fix this tip. But one thing to note that the steel on this sword is actually uh, a little bit soft. Now, also, uh, while there is no rattle 
in the blade at all uh, whatsoever. The guard is in fact uh, loose, that there is a little bit of lateral movement. In fact, uh, quite a bit of lateral movement. Um, it's not loose, there's no rattling in terms of looseness, but it is, you, you can move it uh, laterally, you know, um, side to side. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see it there. I am actually moving the guard. So uh, yeah, that's one thing. Now, now that was like that before I started the wood test. Uh, it seems to have gotten a little bit worse. And like I said, this is a peen construction. Um, I don't notice any movement in the pommel. And like I said, there's no rattle and um, you can still hear the ringing. So everything is nice and tight. Uh, it's just that the guard is moving uh, a little bit. So <clears throat> yeah, one thing to note there about the guard construction. Now, it probably has to do with the fact that there is a pretty considerable gap here. Um, if this were a much um, tighter tolerance here, a much tighter gap, um, you know, or practically no gap, this, this issue probably wouldn't happen. So, yeah. Okay, let's talk about the scabbard real quick that it came with. Um, I've read a lot of reviews of the Hanway Tinker Norman sword and the other Hanway Tinker swords, and a lot of the negative criticism for these swords is focused on this piece right here, <laughs> the scabbard. And so basically what we have here is a very thin, lightweight uh, le uh, wood core leather wrapped scabbard and uh, you can see here it is got some stitching here around this collar piece and it's stitched uh quite cleanly and nicely down the middle here and there is this uh sort of horseshoe shaped um shape it seems to be some sort of cheap stainless steel and uh it also comes with two leather loops here um that act as sort of a belt suspension system with two metal hoops here. So if you did have a belt um, or a belt system that would fit this, then you have a way to, of course, mount the sword on your um, on your belt. So what do I think of it? Well, it's cool that you actually get one. Um, I, I think it's, it's nice that in the sub $300 category, you can get a scabbard. Uh, there are swords that are $1,000 and they don't come with a scabbard, uh, not even a cheap one like this. And so that is appreciated that you do get one. However, it is lackluster. I mean, there's not really much to write home about it. It's a simple black cheap leather scabbard. Now, I happen to like the um, Hanway cheap scabbards more than the windless ones. The windless ones usually don't have a wood core. Uh, they just have sort of like that stiff, uh, stiff leather. And I mentioned windless because it's in the same price category as this sword here. Uh, windless swords usually are sub $300. Uh, so I do actually like it in terms of uh, what it serves for, uh, what purpose it serves, which is to protect the sword, protect your hands, um, and keep the sword in a nice spot, uh, safe and uh, ready to be used for your backyard cutting. So I do think it's very good for that. However, there is a lot to be desired here. This is not really um, a very attractive uh, piece and I don't really think it's meant to be I just think it's supposed to come along with this with the sword for storage. And so how does the sword fit in the scabbard? Well, it fits actually quite nicely. Uh, there is no rattle whatsoever. It is almost a perfect fit for the sword. Uh, the tension is good, as you can see. I have the sword upside down and I shake it a little bit and the sword does come out, but it still doesn't fall right out. Uh, there is just the right amount of tension in the throat area. It looks like they've put some shims in there or something to um, keep the sword nice and safe inside. However, it is a very, very good fit for this sword. Um, I was actually very surprised at how well it did fit. So uh, in terms of holding the sword and acting as a scabbard, it performs that function quite nicely. Uh, you're just not gonna get a lot of frills uh, in this price category for something like 
this. Okay, let's wrap this up and I'll give you guys my final opinion of this sword. So, what do I think of this sword? Do I think it's worth your money? Well, it has some issues. And chief among those issues, of course, and one of my, um, one of the things that really gives me some concern is, of course, the heat treatment um, on the sword in this particular example. As you guys saw, the sword did take a set. I was able to bend it back. It didn't bend back that easily, which was a little bit of a plus there because if had I been able to bend it back um, very, very easily, then I would definitely know that the sword is too soft. Uh, we did have the tip rolling and um, I thought about the tip rolling um, ever since I filmed that earlier portion of the video where the tip, uh, where I showed you guys that the tip actually rolled. And um, yeah, I, I thought about it and a little bit more and I do think that that is a big problem. Um, I do think that that is a indicator uh, in conjunction with the fact that the sword took a slight set on cutting that wood uh, that what we have here is a heat treatment that's not done very well. And uh, this gives me a little bit of concern because um, this is a budget range sword, which means who is gonna buy this sword? Uh, people that are just starting to get into this hobby, uh, maybe somebody that wants a, a good Norman sword, but like I said, they're, they're, they're just getting into this hobby. They don't wanna spend that much money for an Albion or something like that. And that means that they're probably not uh, well experienced or trained in using these swords and when they take it out into their backyard and they cut stuff They're gonna hit their stand. They're gonna hit other things besides their uh, Intended target and you want the sword to be resilient. I think in this particular price category uh, 5160 is a very good steel um, and I've uh, had many swords made out of that particular steel and when properly heat treated, it's incredible. Uh, however, it looks like they didn't get that right here. So that, that for me is actually a very big problem. The other thing that uh, really sort of bothers me is this gap in the cross guard. Now, just having a gap in the cross guard is not really that big of a deal for me. I've had many swords that have had gaps, um, particularly swords from Dark Sword Armory and, and, and other makers, um, where the cross guard, although it has a gap, is still pretty solid and doesn't really move around. Uh, this here, I think the, the very, let's see if you guys can see it. I think that the very large gap uh, in the cross guard lended itself to um, not having enough tension to keep this thing from moving. And as a result, uh, what I noticed after actually some of the bottle cutting was that the cross guard is moving around and I can shift it pretty easily. Now it is worth noting that it doesn't rattle and that is a good thing. However, um, you, it's, it's, it's annoying that the cross guard moves. Um, and actually, if you uh, move the sword in this particular fashion here, you can kind of feel some things shifting around uh, in the hilt portion here. It's probably the tang um, shifting very, very slightly. Now, this isn't major uh, in terms of the sword's functionality. It is something though that is worth noting and it is something that really displeases me. Uh, those two things there, especially the heat treatment, uh, make it so that it's very difficult for me to recommend this sword. Now, this sword does have some things that is, that is actually going for it um, and some things that I really do like. So this is actually a very tough decision. One, the overall design of the sword, okay? Um, the dimensions, the features, and just the, the general A aesthetics, I think is spot on for a Type 10A. And uh, you can tell that someone who knows swords helped design this thing, Michael Tinker Pierce, because the dimensions and everything are very, very nice and I think historically accurate. And the sword does feature a nice degree of distal taper. Um, if this sword did not have proper distal taper, I guarantee you it would be very, very difficult to move around because of how broad and long this blade is. 
but because it has really nice distal taper and the edge geometry is actually very very nice also uh, it's one of the things that I really like about the sword it gets quite thin over here towards the top uh, especially in the cutting portion of the blade um, it has pretty nice it, it's a pretty rigid sword but it does have some flex and you can see it's flexing in this portion here which is where you want it to um, and it did not come sharp enough to do very effective cutting but because the edge geometry was so nice and the overall blade design is so nice um, it was very very easy to sharpen and get this thing very very sharp so uh, I like the way the sword handles it's a very good tool for learning how to use a Norman era sword or a sword of the earlier medieval period so ah oh, man I really do like it and and um those features I really like. And the grip is actually um, a highlight. Uh, this leather is very comfortable. I don't think it's really the most high quality leather out there, but it's very comfortable. And uh, once you learn how to hold a sword that has such a large Brazil nut style pommel, um, this sword is actually very, very comfortable. And you can imagine this thing delivering some amazingly powerful cuts. I would not want to be hit by this sword <laughs> a lot of inertia in the cut so yeah it, it it has a lot going for it it just has two major things that give me pause in recommending it so um, my final opinion is it really all depends okay if you're gonna take this thing outside and really do some extensive cutting uh, hopefully um, I would I, I would keep an eye on the heat treatment I don't know if this particular example that I have here has a heat treatment problem and others do not. Um, and other reviews that I've read of this sword, I really haven't seen anyone complain about the heat treatment. So that's a good sign. So I, I could just have one that is relatively softer than, than the ones that are out there. Now, there is an interesting note that I have to throw out there. Um, it's not necessarily historically inaccurate that the steel is uh, a little bit on the soft side because, um, you know, swords of the Norman era, you know, the 11th century, their steel would have been actually probably softer than this here. So it's not historically inaccurate that the sword took a set and uh, that is a little bit of a softer steel however for people who are doing modern day cutting and taking it out in their backyards and swinging it and hitting stuff with it you do want a very resilient blade and 5160 should be a very resilient good steel um, it does come with a scabbard that is another plus but like i said guys um just keep an eye out on the heat treatment if you decide to buy one of these things. If there is anyone out there that actually owns one of these um, and it has swung it around and hit harder targets with it, let me know if you guys had a problem with the heat treatment and let other people know as well. Uh, it'd be interesting to know um, how people's experiences vary with this type of sword. There's not a lot of people out there who did reviews of this sword, so... Um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see if you guys have had experience with it, if you've had similar experience. So overall, I think for less than $300, it's an okay sword. Um, has a lot of great features, but there's some quality control problems uh, with it, and you may have the same experience. Or you may not so uh, it's a very sort of wishy-washy recommendation guys I, I can't give it my full recommendation because of the issues that I had uh, at the same time like I said I do like a lot of its features so the decision is really up to you I hope the information that I provided you here today helps you decide whether or not to get one of these things um, yeah, so thanks for coming by. Uh, please leave a like. Please subscribe down below. Please leave some comments um, if you want to talk about sword-related things. Uh, and thanks for coming by. And till next time, stay safe and keep um, keep your eyes open for new reviews because I got definitely I got more stuff coming up. All right, guys. See ya.